What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. Out of all the people, the Jesus actor stops and points and looks at me and calls me out of the entire crowd. (laughs) This funny, hilarious joke because my hair, you know, and he's like, hey, you look like me. (laughs) And right at that moment, um, somebody happened to snap a picture of it. And they gave it to me. And I have this beautiful picture. Maybe I'll share it. I have this picture strapped right there of Jesus looking down directly at me. And I know that God was trying to say something at that time. Hello. Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit podcast. I'm your host, Helen Todd. And you just heard from Josh Anderson, who will be our guest today. Josh has come a long way from a teenager with a big drug use problem to currently working on his PhD, raising three young kids with his wife, Natalie, all the while also starting a new business. His idea of serving God was challenged and shaped while he spent two years on a missionary assignment in Japan. But more recently, Josh had an experience with Christ on the set of the very popular TV show, The Chosen, that he's going to share with us today. Let's get right into the interview and hear from Josh himself. Hi, Josh. Thank you for coming on the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Helen. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Excited for our time together. Well, I actually can't wait to catch up on some news here. So let's start with this. So you were cast as an extra in this hugely popular series, Chosen, which, by the way, has that episode come out already? Yeah, it just aired. Yeah, the one that I was in was the last episode of season two. So it's the big Sermon on the Mount scene there. It wasn't such as big of a deal because there was like 3,000 other people, but (laughs) I was an extra and was uh, able to record it on that. Also, there'll be another scene in season three. Are you kidding? That is a huge deal. I I can't wait to watch this episode now. I will be looking for you in the crowd. But uh, tell me, how how did this come about? How did you end up in this episode? Well, it's a little crazy. So to really appreciate the full story, maybe I'll back up. Because at this time of my life, I was like, I'm super, super busy and crazy. So I'm in a PhD program. I'm you know, trying to start this new business. I'm doing a big website relaunch for my other business. I'm in this online class seeking ordination and doing all these things. And it's basically too busy, too much. And it's like that verse where Paul's like, you know, if you give your body even over to be burned without love, it doesn't profit you anything. And I know very deeply I'm supposed to be responsible for my family and and my children first. That's my first and primary ministry. But here I am like with my hands and pokers and all these different fires. And then I get chosen by, ironically, the chosen producers. And uh, yeah, so I won this thing where they, I don't know, emailed me and asked me these questions and they interviewed me and said, yeah, we want to, we want to send TV cameras to your house. We want to follow you around for a week and record your story and get, you know, record you traveling to the set. And then we're going to interview you on stage and, and by the way, are you okay with the fact that, you know, 50 million to 60 million people will see this, you know? Wait, did they do this to all 3,000 people or how how did they? No, uh, I just got selected of the 3,000 uh, to hear my story. Um, wow. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here reading this inter- this email and I had the interview with them and, and Natalie, my wife, comes up and sort of almost prophetically rebukes me in a sense in this way she says you know josh look at you you're concerned about this you're thinking about this you're interested in making this big great impact and stuff on stage but look at us here your children your your wife your family you know are you responsible to loving us the best that you're ready to go out and do this sort of thing and she was absolutely 100 percent correct it cut me right to the quick i broke down and we had this 
beautiful moment. It was a moment of actual repentance, I think. And so we prayed, we sat on it, we decided not to do it. Um, yeah, so we didn't go. So you know what happened was I actually went to the chosen uh, film day. It's just one guy in the middle of the crowd with the other 3,000 people, just a regular old same, uh, there in the big crowd. And I remember it was crazy when it was time to do the big shot with everybody there. Um, I even purposely like walked to the back of the crowd and just told the Lord, like, I'm, I'm going back here. You know, uh, I know that the place you have for me is to be faithful to you first. And that's it. That's the thing. So I, I did. But then afterwards, and this is the interesting part. Afterwards, I said, hey, we need more people to come up here for another shot. Um, and this will be in season three. But yeah. And so they picked us to come up to work from the front. And they told us, you know, earlier in the day, hey, there's going to be no photographs with the actors. You can't take any pictures. There's so many of you guys. We can't have photos with everybody. So no cameras, please. But yeah, here I am. And then out of all the people, the Jesus actor stops and points and looks at me and calls me out of the entire crowd. <laughs> this funny, hilarious joke because my hair, you know, and he's like, hey, you look like me. <laughs> and right at that moment, um, somebody happened to snap a picture of it. And they gave it to me. And I have this beautiful picture. Maybe I'll share it. I have this picture shaped right there of Jesus looking down directly at me. And I know that God was trying to say something at that time. I know he was trying to say, look, I see you. Out of all these people, I see you and love you. You don't have to be on some giant big stage or telling your story, millions of people or being interviewed by these things in order to get some sort of sense of worth, to get some sort of identity or to be great in the kingdom. Instead, instead, I feel Jesus has been redefining greatness for me, radically redefining greatness and saying, you know, Josh, wouldn't it be great if you loved the least of these and, and, and the people right around you here? Wouldn't it be great if you brought your king, my kingdom into your spheres of influence right there where you are? And that's how God's been really radically, radically changing me since, since this experience. Because I knew in that moment, in that picture, in the photograph, I see he sees me and loves me. So I don't need to earn any sort of other sense of other people seeing me. That's a crazy story, Josh. Actually, we could wrap up the episode right here. <laughs> that was a mini sermon here. That was incredible. You know, this is really very powerful. So tell me, I, if I am to watch this episode, am I going to see you on the screen? Have you seen yourself on the screen? Well, I look, you know, we paused it and like zoomed in. I know where I was in the very, very back, very back of the crowd next to the centurion soldier and his little horse back there. So it is hard to make me out there. But in season three, uh, there's a scene where we're at, there's, I don't, probably shouldn't be sharing it, but there will be, at least you'll know this, Jesus will be preaching the sermon, right? And they had this giant crane that like had this boom arm that sent it out like 80 feet or something it felt like. And that camera went right, I'm sorry, it went right by the side of the back of my head. So at least you're going to see this big hairy like this <laughs> back of my head in season three. But what a great takeaway from this experience. Jesus saying, I see you, Josh. This you know, this is something that every single one of us at one point in life just needs to hear, even though we know this in, in the back of our mind and the depths of our soul. Isn't that wonderful to hear sometime? I see you. Even if no one else knows, I see you and I know your heart. So that's not always been, though, the intimacy of your relationship with Jesus. So you had a bit of a rocky start <laughs> early on. Let's talk about that. You grew up in a very devout Christian home. I know your parents very well, and they're awesome. Um, but, you know, we all have to make, we can't live on our parents' faith. We all have to find our own Jesus, our own relationship, our own intimacy. So how did that process happen in your life yeah so you're right we did grow up in a great you know christian home um, but my entire family my parents and us included have been on a journey where jesus has been further and further sanctifying and saving us because when we were really little we were part of a form of christianity maybe you could consider it more fundamentalist i suppose but 
um, in this sense. We took doctrine and our beliefs about Jesus very seriously. Um, however, we didn't have as big of an emphasis on actual holiness. So I think theologians would say this is um, antinomialism or, or antinomialism. Sorry, that's a big word, but I think theologians would basically say this. They call it cheap grace or easy, easy believism. Um, basically, we just thought what was really important was believing the right things about Jesus rather than actually loving and knowing Jesus. <laughs> So we got our worth and sense from this, so having the right ideas, being in the we have all the answers club type view of religion. Um, and we just didn't take seriously the idea that God actually wants to save us from our sin. <laughs> we thought, you know, yeah, we just believe this thing. We say this right prayer. And, you know, God's going to save us from the consequences of our sin. But God loves us way more than that. I found he actually wants to save us from our sin, to save us from it. And at, at the time of the youth, I didn't have that conception at all. I didn't believe in Jesus, but I did not focus on him as actually being my master, being my Lord. So this big grace way this manifested itself in my life was through for illicit and illegal drug use. So I was, I was crazy. You know, I was doing crazy sorts amounts of drugs. You name it whatever is there. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until I, you know, but at this entire time though, there was this still small and nagging voice in the back of my spirit, drawing, constant drawing of God, where I just, I already knew deep down God's voice saying to me, Josh, this is not the, this is not the way for you. This is not the path that your life. And I would think forward, and imagine where my life will be if I continue on. And I knew he was calling me off of it. And so it wasn't until I went to some Bible camps and got exposed to a wider range of Christian, um, you know, the, the whole body you know, of Christ, giving different gifts and different things, and that I finally and truly got convicted that this is not right. This is wrong. And Jesus wants to be my master. And he's telling me to quit. So then I came to this forced decision. And that was really, I believe, my moment of actual conversion, where my heart was converted from I am the master of what I want to do to Jesus, you are my master. You are my Lord. That means you're my boss, and I will listen and believe and trust in you that you're going to do this. And so I did. And by God's grace, I've been completely drug-free for 18 years now since that time. So was it? hard i mean considering you were deeply involved involved in it and for many people it takes a rehabilitation process or program how yeah. how did that happen for you well i found out very not very quickly but i found out when i tried to quit i couldn't and this is the thing is you think that you know, in sin you know you think that you're being the master of your own ship but actually you're becoming enslaved all sin is this way you were becoming enslaved. And now I realized I am not the boss of whether or not I can take these drugs anymore. I, I found it, but I couldn't stop because I tried. <laughs> and it would always come back a weakness again. So it was just like I didn't go to any rehabilitation program. I didn't go to any AH meetings. Um, but the same sort of process of giving over yourself to him, I just told him, I was like, Lord, I can't do this. I need you to heal me miraculously and help me. And what that's what happened. He did help me. And he also used greatly um, my wife-to-be, Natalie, at the time as well, at that point in my life. And she rescued me. And, and we had to come out from the group of people that were living that lifestyle. There was no other way. We had to come out from them because I was not strong enough to continue to live with one foot in the world there um, you know, or be around drug use. Instead, God wanted to set me apart. And he did. He rescued me. And I'm very so thankful. For well, speaking of your lovely wife, Natalie, whom I also know and love dearly, um, you guys have an interesting story. Um, so I have two sons and I always tell them missionary dating doesn't work. Don't even start dating a person who is not a believer because this really muddies the water, so to speak. But that was not 
the case. Actually, your story is the success story of missionary dating. So share share a little bit about that. Well, what happened, it's sort of a partial and strange success. But like, what happened was we did start dating first. And I... And she was an atheist, right? She was at this time, I mean, she could tell her own story, but she was raised kind of in a Christian home, but had a time of rebellion and falling away. She would call herself agnostic or Buddhist or any of these things, but she thought organized religion was a bunch of hypocrites at a social country club type thing. And so she was not a believer at that time. And I came on hard. Like I pushed the apologetics because I I just repented of all this sin in my life. I was really on fire for Jesus, 100% going in this direction. And I was like, just basically, if I had a Bible, uh, like physically bashing her is what it kind of was like. Um, but, I, but I loved her so much. I mean, um, but it didn't work. It was like she had these spiritual earmuffs. And as soon as I started talking about anything about God, I could almost physically see the earmuffs go on. Her eyes would glaze over and she cannot hear anything that I'm saying. And it was it was terribly frustrating. And the hardest thing that I ever had to do was decide to break up with her. So I actually dumped her (laughs) Um, because I knew at this time, I knew what the Bible says that you should not be unequally yoked um, in a marriage situation. I knew that if I'm not, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life being married to someone who doesn't uh, share the deepestly held value of my entire being. The only thing that matters the most to me is my love for this, for my savior. And, and if you can't share that deepest thing with me, I can't, it doesn't make sense. So the Bible teaches, I know the Bible teaches that. So I did. And then I was hugely depressed <laughs> and I prayed for her every day after that, starting for the entire summer vacation. I just prayed for her. So I adopted a new strategy instead of the like push harder strategy. I said, Lord, she's in your hands. I prayed for her, prayed for her. And something shifted. At the end of the summer, she finally agreed, okay, I'll come to this Bible study with you. And she came. And then she started asking like all these questions. So did she reach out to you or reached out, you reached out to you her? You know, I honestly don't remember who gave the invitation again. I think I had invited her again um, to the Bible study that was at our house. And she agreed to come. Uh, yeah. And then that became a sweet honeymoon period where she began asking all these questions, all these questions about the faith. What about this? What about that? How, how does this make sense? And at that time I got to use apologetics more as a helping ministry to say, well, think of these answers. Think of these. Here it is. If you love him, you can see for yourself. If you want to look, you want to study, you can learn. Here they are. And, and she did. She was hungry. And I think so interesting to think about that. And she, she got saved and I got to lead her through it and disciple her. And we're still together today. I don't think it would have happened if I would have kept calling the old approach. And I, what shifted was, you know, if you ever heard of the, the great classic movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, if you no, read the I don't end of the so. book, there's this, this horrible scene, but there's a scene where um, the soldier, you know, jumps into his, um, this is World War One, so they have the trench warfare, and jumps into his trench and just very quickly and instinctively just stabs him. And then he's in this terrible situation now where this person is bleeding out and he takes several hours to die there. And he realizes, what have I done? You know, and he has this moment with the French soldier who's dying and, and he real and he tells him, I'm, I'm sorry that I killed you. And he says, you know, it wasn't you that I stabbed. It was the abstraction, the enemy abstraction of you that I stabbed. But now I see you're a person here with your photo of your family and things. And that's a gut-wrenching story, but in our culture today, we have been trained to view other non-Christians or atheists or unbelievers or these sorts of things. It's all been politically polarized now that we have abstracted the person and the ideas that they hold. We view them as an enemy and we attack. But Christ does not work this way. Christ went out on the lost crowds and he looked out over them and he saw them as lost sheep and he had pity and compassion. The Apostle Paul talks about his family that was not believers, and he says yeah, he was in great anguish and pain and compassion for them. When I switched my strategy from attack, attack, enemy, enemy ideas, and I conflated them to I will pray, I love compassion, I love love, um, that 
was the key shift that I believe was able to enable that transformation and God to use that in her life. Not to say the answers and truth are not important. They are. And there was a time for that in her discipleship. But it came from where my heart had to get right first. Because if I have my internal motivations to um, harm and attack, you know, to be debate, you know, debating and stuff rather than loving, um, it just didn't help in the way that she needed. You know, and and I think that this is, this is an extremely important point, especially the way our culture and our society is right now. This is something that needs to be uh, brought to light and reminded, you know, to people. And what a great gift you received through that. You you got a wonderful spouse <laughs> and a beautiful family because you were willing to um, just have that different shift of your perspective, you know, um, and put love first above your differences. And so that's that's quite a lovely story. And I, I just love your beautiful family and your kids. So um, then um, you and Natalie became missionaries all of a sudden uh, with a long-term assign- assignment to Japan, uh, which um, I am, I don't think we're really caught up fully on how it all went. So I'm anxious to talk to you about that. Um, how did you even feel called to go to Japan? Where did that start? Well, you know, it must have started young because we had a crazy experience on our calling uh, to go. And I don't, I should say up front, I don't believe you need to have some crazy, amazing experience like this to be called into the mission field because Christ already said, go, you know, go. Um, but in our case, we did have a very interesting experience where um, we were praying about going and, you know, we kept being drawn like a force of gravity to mission to the world, which is part of the PCAs, uh, the Presbyterian Church in, in America's uh, mission board. And we're like, Lord, we're not Presbyterian. Why would we go? You know, we have to say that we disagree with some of their statement of beliefs and things, you know, but it was just a force of gravity, of spiritual gravity just calling us there. I don't know. And I was struggling really hard with my motivations too. Like, why do I really want to go? Um, you know, we had just found out Natalie had birth family in Japan. She, her birth mother and family lived there. And we were thinking about maybe going to China before that, actually, because we went with you. <laughs> To China, and so we're like, why do why do I want to switch to Japan? Is because I want my wife to be able to learn Japanese and speak to her, her birth mother. Because my motivations are not one hundred percent pure here. Um, what is the Lord? And I was struggling. And at that time, the week we put in the application, we said, okay, we're going to pray and see what God does. The week we put in the application, my brother finds this letter that was a time capsule hidden in a jar. And it was hidden in my parents' library behind these books. And he found it and it's dated from 16 years before. And I still have the letter, but for 16 years, this thing was sitting in a jar and I wrote it. And it said, hey, um, whoever finds this time capsule, hi, my name's Josh. Let me tell you all this stuff about my life. <laughs> and it says all these really terrible, embarrassing things. But one part it says is, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I know I've always loved Japan. So when I grow up, I'm going to move to Japan and tell them about God. I have no memory writing that. No memory whatsoever. But here it is. And now I ask myself, what are the odds that this letter has been sitting in a jar for 16 years? And the week we find it is the week we're praying if we should go to Japan. That, that is, that's incredible. So God called us so hard to go, and we did go. But you know what happened? It was the hardest two years of our entire life. <laughs> it was the most painful suffering and refining fire where every bit of idolatry within me was boiled up to the surface. And everything that I rely upon other than God failed at the end. And it's just like Paul said, this happened so that we could re- not re- learn not to rely on God. But, uh, but instead, I'm sorry, not to rely on ourselves, but to rely on God who raises the dead. That's, that was our experience of Japan. We went and God called us so strongly to go. And then we had, my mom had a, 
a stroke. Natalie's father got diagnosed with state, stage four cancer. We um, couldn't find housing for the first three months we were there and they rejected our housing once they found out we were foreigners. Um, yeah, then uh, the first month we got there, our team leader quit, which in the PCA means you can't start a church unless you have a, a PCA ordained task pastor. And then, uh, so it was, it was like hard, 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 hard the entire time. But we knew God had called us to it. And that was such an interesting experience. Such a, And that shifted a lot of my framework. And I realized, wow, God just doesn't want to just save Japanese people, and send them, which he does. But he doesn't want to do that. He also wants to save me from my sin. And there is parts of my sin that I still love and hold on to. And I would not have let go if I had not been taken away from my context in America, of my comforts here, my family that I can rely on, my church that I can rely on, my English language abilities I can rely on, my, you know, basically all these things in my life, structures in place were taken away. And I had to rely on only God. And at that moment, there was like, where Jesus is like, are you going to leave too? It was the choice again. And that's been the same choice of the arc of my entire life. It's like the scripture says in Ephesians chapter four, where the job of the ministers is to equip us until we all grow up into full maturity in Christ. And that has been a full lifeline process. And I'm not there yet. I'm sure there'll be more, there's more growing to be done, but he is working in me till that until I grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ until the image of him, the perfect human is alive inside of me and that perfect love is going inside of me. And sometimes we have to go through refining fire and that burning um, hard times in order to get through it, I believe. And I think that's what happened for us because I look back at my time in Japan and I'm like, wow, God did more in me, I feel like, than I did for anybody else I was there. Yeah. But. This is perfect because this has been so consistent, you know, with um, my experience of doing missions work for oh, well over 20 years now, and that we um, respond to the Great Commission mostly thinking, you know, I'm just doing what God wants me to do. I'm helping God to win people for him. Which, if you think about it, God doesn't need our help really in anything, you know. He can bring people to the knowledge of Him without our help. So, more often than not, we're meant to go and respond to that call because there is work that needs to be done within us. And it's such an intimate experience with God when you go, well, you you, you know from your own experience when you are in a foreign culture and you can't lean on your own experience or knowledge. Um, you're sort of there on your own. It's you and God. And he He puts you in just that perfect position where he can do work in you and uh, mold you to that perfect image that he has in mind. So that's, that's very, very cool. So you know, this uh, interview is still part of our series, Change Lives, Change Lives. So what are your thoughts in terms of that? Because, um, you know, I, I believe that our life is changed by Christ, not just for our own sake, but also because that transformation is contagious. So um, any thoughts uh, on on that subject? Absolutely. So. God, I believe the whole scripture, <laughs> when the story of humanity is God saving us from idolatry, of sin, of trusting things other than God, of loving things other more than God. So when you can see kind of the history of my life as these different idols, you know, drug use is an idol. Um, my, at one point, a pursuit of knowledge about God and knowing all the answers rather than knowing God. That's knowledge as an idol. Um, and then also trying to live this great, amazing life and do something awesome for God and be great. That's an idol too, rather than trusting in Christ is great. And so each one of these things he's freed me 
to love. And when your heart is now set free from those things, you are more able to be able to love others. And so they taught us as we were a missionary to run what's called a language route. You know, when you're learning a new language, one of the best ways is to have a bunch of vocab, but then talk to real people in real context. So they would say, hey, study your vocab, then go out into your neighborhood and go to the baker and say, hi, baker, I'm learning Japanese. These are the new words I learned today. Will you help me say them? And you say the words, and then you go to the uh, panya store, the you know, or, or you go to the gas station, or you go to the different places in your life, the grocery store, and you say, hi, I'm learning Japanese, and these are the words I learned. And you use the same words in this loop, like a language route. And just do that every day, and people will say, who is this weirdo coming into our flight? Here he is again. But then they'll say, here he is again. And then you develop this relationship, and then they try to start helping you, and then you you develop these relationships and then it opens the door for evangelism in the future because they know you, they like you, you're part of their life. And they taught us when you do your language route, the greatest thing you can do is just be openly Christian. In Japan, just being a joyful Christian publicly is spiritual warfare. And so what I'm trying to do in my life now that even I'm back in America, I'm still running a language route. I'm running it here in my neighborhood, when I, that, which means I'm intentional. I don't just go to get gas. I go inside to pay for my gas, not outside at the machine. I go inside so I see the same teller and I see him again and I see him again. And I just publicly be a Christian in normal life around the different areas that I go. And that alone is a form of spiritual warfare in our isolated and increasingly small little individual prison cell suburban units where we each have our own Netflix piped in and our own you know, groceries delivered and nobody is seeing anybody else. It is spiritual warfare to go out in the world in the sense um, of just intentionally being a Christian in public around the people that you know and love. And that that provides the context to where uh, relationships are being formed. People know you. And then when something happens in their life, when they get diagnosed with cancer, they know hey, this is the guy who always comes in here. You know, every week they know he's a spiritual person and I'm going to talk to him about it. I'm going to ask him to pray. And God brings all these open doors and opportunities right into your lap as being intentional in that way. So that's the greatest thing I've been taking back from Japan and implementing it now back in my life here in America. Thank you so much, Josh. I can't wait to watch that episode of Chosen and the future one in season three and look for your hair or if I can see you in the crowd. And uh, thank you again for coming on the podcast. What an interesting conversation with Josh. I'm especially touched by how Christ showed himself faithful when Josh gave up the spotlight of being featured on the series Chosen to prioritize his family. Our faith is a journey of millions of small steps and sacrifices nobody knows about, but Jesus knows. He sees you, he's pleased with you, and he wants to mold you and use you for a greater purpose. If you are unsure of what your greater purpose is and how to connect to it, or perhaps like Josh, you have had a dream of fulfilling the Great Commission in a faraway country or even in your own hometown, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how World Missions Alliance can help you. Thank you for listening again, and I'm your host, Helen Todd. Until next time. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.